In module 5.4, we're going to be going over the, uh, the standard orthodox Black-Scholes-Merton option valuation model. I'm going to refer to it as a geometric Brownian motion model, a geometric Brownian motion option valuation model, because I'm going to contrast it in module 5.5 with the arithmetic Brownian motion option valuation model. And in module 5.5, I'll spend uh, quite a bit of time in contrasting the two models and, and try to justify the need for more than just one model. But before we get there, um, it's, it would be good to go over the standard model. The, the standard model uh, has a set of assumptions. Um, we'll look at the role of dividends and how to uh, encode it in R. Uh, we'll look at different representations. I'll actually quickly derive the Black Scholes Merton, uh, um, not not necessarily because it's it's important for you to be able to do it, but it's uh, important to understand uh, exactly where the Nobel Prize winning idea came from and what some of the implications are. And we'll look at some standard plots. Um, the central finance concepts is that the uh, this model is based on geometric Brownian motion, and if you recall, what that means is that uh, the underlying terminal price distribution is log normal. And this is an important implication because if the uh, terminal price distribution is actually negatively skewed, then starting out with a model that implies a positive skew is certainly a challenge uh, hence the need for a different model, such as arithmetic Brownian motion. Again, the, the main motivation is to encourage you as a financial quant to uh, apply your trade in a very creative way and come up with your own model and come up with your own insights um, uh, that perhaps no one else has thought of. We'll look at some key assumptions and some graphical illustrations. Again, the key foundational assumption is the terminal distribution is log normal. Uh, we assume the risk-free interest rate is constant with uh, borrowing and lending allowed at that rate. Uh, volatility, the underlying instrument is continuously com uh, instruments continuously compounded rate of return is known, positive, and constant. And we're going to be looking at European style options only. These uh, continuous time models cannot handle Amer American style options. Um, with any kind of uh, simplicity, hence the binomial model re remains attractive uh, for American style options, even with the existence of these uh, much faster, quote, closed form uh, solutions. And so we'll be looking at just European style options only. <clears throat> the plots will look at values and boundaries. They're going to look at almost identical to the binomial model. Uh, we need to be sure they don't violate arbitrage boundaries, uh, and um, they should roughly correspond to observed option prices. Uh, and we could look at things like the geometric Brownian motion option valuation models time value. And we'll do quite a bit of comparisons uh, when we get to mod the, the uh, module 5.5. The end result of running a model of this nature is you end up with uh, what looks identical to the binomial model. Uh, we have an upper and lower bound for both calls and puts. We've got the actual call value and the actual put value. And if you'll notice, it asymptotically moves. In the case of the call, it moves to zero as the stock price declines, and it moves to uh, the lower bound as the stock price rises. Again, the upper bound really plays no role. Uh, and that with the put value, as the stock price goes up, it tends to zero. Remember, the, um, the put is in the money if, it, it, if the price ends up below the strike price. And it ends up, it asymptotically goes to the lower bound as the stock price goes down. And if you'll notice that even though this is a 100 strike um, uh, option, the... Um, the break point is actually the present value of that strike because of the time value of money. We'll also look at cash or nothing and asset or nothing uh, digital options, uh, primarily because a call option is simply a long asset or nothing call and a short cash or nothing call. 
and a put is a long a cash or nothing put and short an asset or nothing put. And so one way to examine the behavior of call and put options is to look at the behavior of these underlying digital options to try to understand some of the uh, implicit moving parts. <clears throat> On the quantitative uh, uh, materials, we need to adjust for dividends. We'll look at the assumptions carefully. Uh, there'll be the, the boundary conditions that we've gone over before. We'll do the derivation and look at the digital option valuation expressions. The standard uh, GBM OVM assumptions, um, there's a, remember there was this set of standard finance presuppositions and assumptions apply. For example, clean property rights, clear rule of law, culture of trust. Um, the underlying instrument uh, behaves randomly and follows a log normal distribution, or it follows a geometric Brownian motion more precisely. We assume a risk-free interest rate exists, is constant, and borrowing and lending is allowed. A volatility of the underlying instrument's continuously compounded rate of return is known, positive, and constant. Um, and then um, there's no market frictions like taxes, transaction costs. Um, we assume unconstrained short selling as well as continuous trading. Uh, and, and all I assume about the investor, I do not assume that there are utility maximizers or uh, uh, rational agents. All I, all I assume is given a choice between $20 or $0, uh, all, everything else the same, they'd prefer to receive 20 than zero. That is, they just simply prefer more to less, and that's it. Options are European style, that the exercise is available only at maturity, and the underlying instrument may pay a constant continuous cash flow yield, as well as possible discrete cash flows. So uh, by combining these two, I can have a single model that can address either continuous cash flows or discrete. Uh, dividends are going to, we're going to assume the escrow method. If you remember the escrow method, the first thing you do is you compute the present value of the dividends over the option life. Uh, in this case, if it's uh, continuously uh, uh, paid dividends, the present value of the dividends is simply S0 times 1 minus E to the minus dividend yield times time to maturity. Uh, and then if it's discrete dividend, it's simply just taking the present value of the remaining dividend payments over the life of the option. The underlying instrument sans dividends or without dividends is simply just subtracting off the present value of the dividends. And so S prime is simply, uh, the, we're going to assume S prime is what follows geometric Brownian motion uh, because the present value of the dividends are held in escrow and there's no uncertainty or concerns about when and how they'll be paid. The generic option valuation model, again, uh, compressing it to uh, understand um, how, to, how to basically express this idea. The value of an option is simply the present value of the expected terminal payout. Uh, it turns out that this expected terminal payout, I can use an indicator function for plus one for calls, minus one for puts. And so it's simply the present value at some discount rate uh, uh, and taking the expected value um, over some expected terminal payout. Uh, and and um, this is sort of the generic way to value the options. At this point, we really don't make any assumptions about continuous trading or dynamic rebalancing or anything. The upper and lower bounds can be expressed generically with the indicator function. You could uh, play around with this just to uh, convince yourself that these are represented correctly. The upper bound, again, really plays no role, but I can compress it into one equ equation for calls and puts. Um, the generic option valuation model under the equivalent Martingale measure method, which is a cash flow adjusted method, is uh, the option value is simply the present value at the risk-free rate of the uh, dividend-adjusted um, grossed-up value of the stock times ND1 minus the strike price times ND2. We're taking the present value outside. If I move it inside, this, present, this future value term cancels with this present value, and you get the uh, relatively more familiar expression this way. 
If A O to U is plus one, which is a call, this is your standard dividend adjusted uh, Black Scholes Merton model. If it's minus one, it's a standard put model. And so, and these are the uh, fundamental terms. Very easy to code up if you represent it this way with a single function. If there's only a dividend yield, I could write it out long way, this way, just to make it more clear what the different moving parts are. To derive the Black-Scholes-Merton, we assume the underlying instrument, the uh, stock sands dividend, um, can be modeled in this fashion. This derivation assumes no dividend. But basically, if the underlying follows geometric Browning motion, then based on Ito's lemma, I know that the the uh, terminal distribution or the change in the call is going to grow by uh, this amount. And so the idea is I'm going to build a trading strategy between uh, owning stock and owning this call, long or short. Uh, it turns out if I create a hedge portfolio by selling one call and buying Delta stock, or Delta is simply the partial C, partial S, um, if I look at the value of the portfolio, something magical happens. What, what generated the Nobel Prize winning idea is this mu term in owning the stock and this mu term and having a position in the call cancels out and there's no mu term here. By design, there's no noise term. The, the noise term was, uh, the hedge ratio was selected to cancel the noise terms out. The net result is I have a risk-free portfolio that doesn't have a drift term. Well, it should grow at the risk-free rate. If I set these two items equal each other, I get the uh, traditional Black-Scholes-Merton partial differential equation. If I wanted to incorporate dividend yield, it's going to work out to be here. There's, this is the call option boundary condition. Uh, the digitals work out the way you'd expect them to uh, and be able to combine them to get the, the vanilla calls and puts. Um, the payouts on the digitals, again, I don't want to take too much time on this particular issue, um, but it's uh, clear to see that uh, the combination of an asset or nothing call and a cash or nothing call gets me the plain vanilla call, and the same sort of uh, mapping occurs with the uh, payouts on the puts. The time value term that comes out of this uh, uh, model is clearly uh, reflecting the positive skew of the log normal distribution, and the call time value and put time values are identical. And, and so this will be an issue that we'll take up uh, in module 5.5 on arithmetic Brownian motion option valuation model, uh, which is based, which is going to assume a normal distribution. So in summary, we did a quick review of uh, the assumptions of GBM OVM. The key assumption is the log normal distribution and the ability to co conduct arbitrage, which is known as self-financing dynamic replicating. We looked at that in detail in the binomial model. We explored the role of dividends and how to combine both the dividend yield and discrete dividend payments in a single calculation. We identified different representations of the GBM OVM. You could think of this as with and without dividends. And then if there is dividends, either discrete or continuous, or even both if that, that uh, challenge presented itself. We quickly derived the Black Scholes Merton option valuation model. The Nobel Prize winning insight is the expected return on the stock plays no role in the valuation of the call, assuming I can do the self financing dynamic rep replication and assuming the terminal distribution is log normal. And we also uh, reviewed some of the selected plots. The R code in this particular model is a module is uh, extremely straightforward and uh, I'll set a set aside actually going over that uh, and we will turn our attention in module 5.5 to arithmetic Brownian motion option valuation model, a model most likely you've never seen or never really thought much about. And we're going to compare and contrast these two models hopefully to open your eyes to the fact that there are many, many different ways to do quantitative finance.